So thank you very much. And let me just uh, recap a bit what uh, we have uh, discussed yesterday. So we have introduced uh, the setup of the Nike work. Uh, this is a Spotify group G, which as a manifold this just uh, like a linear space. You can identify with exponential math with uh, the algebra. So uh, the, the algebra itself is stratified, so it's uh, graded, composed as a very sum of S subspaces, I call it G1GS, and that's for layers of the, the algebra, which form a gradation, and the first layer generates uh, the, the, the whole the algebra. The operator that we would like to use in this context is what we call the sub-Laplacian, more precisely a homogeneous that invariant sub-Laplacian L on, uh, on, the, on the certified group, which we form as a sum of squares of certain vector fields, which are actually based on the first layer. So this operator is not elliptic, but because of the bracket generating condition, the first layer generates the, the algebra. It's actually hyperelliptic, satisfies some elliptic estimates for this. Uh, classical result I have And associated to this sub Laplacian, we have a so called sub Riemannian distance. So uh, associated somehow by taking away the more lengths of horizontal curves associated with this, uh, this structure. And we have seen that actually this distance is left invariant. And so it actually can be described in terms of the so called homogeneous norm. So the distance from the origin, which is equivalent to constants to this uh, sum of appropriate powers of the uh, norms of the components of the, of the point into the, the various layers. So somehow this shows that unless we are working in step one, uh, this norm is not, uh, so to say, by nature it's equivalent to the, to the Euclidean norm, but uh, it is at least the topological equivalent. And on the other hand, uh, somehow the natural dimensional parameter associated with such a structure is what we call the homogeneous dimension. So we take a weighted sum of the dimension of, of uh, the various layers with an appropriate weight that somehow is matching these powers that we see here. Now we have discussed that this operator L is self-adjoint. We have a functional calculus, and because of that invariance, Functions of the sub Laplacians can be written as convolution operators, but the convolution can in general is just a distribution, say, and we will be interested in understanding a bit the relation between properties of the function f and properties of the corresponding convolution canon, because in some sense, this is what in this setting can be thought of as generalizing the relation between a function and its Fourier transfer, because in the case of RD, when this is actually the Laplacian. The kernel associated with Fourier multiplier is effectively the inverse Fourier transform of the multiplier that is composed with the symbol of the Laplacian. It's something like that. And we have seen that because of homogeneity, actually, we have a relation between the kernel associated with function f and the kernel associated with a dilated function in terms of automorphic dilations on the curve. Okay, so what I'd like to uh, try and understand again, as I mentioned, is this problem of understanding relations between properties of the kernel and properties of the function f. And in particular, we might be interested in understanding under what conditions on f the corresponding convolution kernel, for example, is integrable because this would imply the p boundedness of the corresponding operator for all p. So this would be one of the uh, somehow. Uh, uh, aims that we have, and in a way now what I'd uh, like to do is to say, well, well as I mentioned uh, yesterday, one possible approach to actually try and understand better the situation is to exploit some information that comes from PDE theory. Somehow uh, the idea is that studying PDEs even in this non-Euclidean, non completely standard setting can be of help because solutions to PDEs may have additional structure and so one can be able to prove uh, properties of these solutions and by using those then one can understand it better uh, also somehow properties for more general functions of the Laplacian. And so uh, let me recall that what we have named the heat kernel yesterday, it's less than convolution kernel of the, the propagator, so the semi-group generator of minus the Laplacian. And for this heat kernel, actually, it is known uh, that we have uh, Gaussian type kernel estimates associated with the 
separate magnetic distance. So this is a result which I think in the generality is due to Baropoulos, 85, 86, but I've seen, of course, a number of contributions. Uh, We know that this function of the heat kernel associated with the subtraction in this setting is actually a smooth function, it's not just a distribution, and its left invariant derivative satisfies point wise estimate of this form. For So this has a shape which is quite similar to the usual Gaussian decay that you can expect for the for the heat cannon, but expressed in terms of uh, the Subramanian distance, okay, from the origin in this case of the point which you compute the uh, the, the curve. This is true not only for the kernel of superis that invariant derivative, somehow the exponent, the, the, the power that you see here is somehow uh, determined essentially by 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 homogeneity consideration. So if you believe that such estimates should go to what is this value should be, it's easy to actually recover. And somehow the content of this result is also showing that there is actually this off diagonal exponential decay, which can be obtained in a number of different ways. And there is this book by the Rockus of Cost and Coulomb that shows how this somehow methods uh, for parabolic ideas can be used actually to also obtains this kind of estimate, even in greater general. And now what I'd like to show is how we can use this information to deduce additional information on for kernels associated to different functions. So consequences for the function of calculus. Suppose that we take a function f, a correct function, which is complex value, which is bounded and compact is equal. Okay, then clearly we can also write now the operator in Cobe, which we know is a bound operator on two. Actually, we can rewrite it as a twiddle of L e to the minus L just by changing the function to a twiddle, which just be uh, the original function multiplied by e, e to the lambda. Okay, and now by this trick, we see that also this new function is bounded and compactly supported. And so now if we take the convolution kernel associated with this operator. This is just a convolution kernel of a composition of two operators. And notice that one of the two operators is actually the heat propagator at time one in this, because of this choice. And now we know that when we have a composition of operators, the corresponding convolution kernel will be the convolution of the two convolution kernels. One has to be careful in this setting because there is the, co the com convolution is not commutative because of non commutativity of the group, so one has to be careful about the ordering. But in this case, actually, interestingly enough, because we are working with functions of the same operator, these two operators commute, so there is actually no problem in this case about the ordering. One can choose whatever order one wants. And as a matter of fact, from this uh, way of writing, one can also recognize the fact that effectively this operator is. Is this kernel can also be thought of as the action of this operator on the other. Now, one has to need some care to justify all these steps, but effectively, what we recognize is that this kernel can be written as the action on the heat kernel, which now we know is a very nice function satisfying the very good case. In particular, it's definitely an L2 function, and the action here is with an L2 bundle. Operator because this function f twiddle is also a bounded function, so by the spectral theorem, it's an to bounded operator. So, again, this gives us that all these kernels are actually a two function. So, we're not really working as soon as we have mild assumptions on this function f, the corresponding convolution kernel is actually 
square integral also with a general function, and actually with similar arguments, one shows that even the uh, left invariant derivatives of this term are in L2 by using the fact that actually not only is the it can be in L2, but also its derivatives, and by Yang's inequality, one can also show that they are even bound. So to effectively, whenever you take a bound and compactly supported function, the kernel associated with this with F of L is actually smooth, and all its left invariant derivatives are bounded and, and in L2. Okay, so we're not really working just with distribution, but with general very nice functions. Okay, and now the fact that at least for compactly supported bounded multipliers, what we get kernels which are in L2, allows one then to tackle one uh, somehow issue, which is, as I mentioned, this kind of relation between the function f and the kernel corresponding to f of L is some sort of analog of a Fourier transform. So one might expect analogous properties there, and one of these properties is somehow having a plasher L. So expressing the L2 norm of the kernel on the group as actually the integral of the function f on the spectrum with respect to some appropriate measure, which is called the plasher n measure associated with the sub Laplace. And as it turns out, as soon as one knows that for compactly supported bounded function f, one has that this property that the, the corresponding term is in L2, then one can use effectively this identity to define the measure, for example, applying this first to characteristic function, so to get what is the value of the measure on a bounded set, and one gets a finite number, one has to show by using orthogonality or spectral projection that this is indeed an additive function on sets and actually sigma additive. And so one can use effectively this formula to define the measure one way or another and show that in this, this sigma L is a, a regular Borel measure on the spectrum. So this actually can be done with greater generality on other groups so one can show this kind of property. But then, uh, the point is, what is this measure? And nicely enough, because of the homogeneity property that we have at our disposal, in this particular case, the plancher and measure is just a multiple of the Lebesgue measure. In this case, it's just constant times the over two lambda over lambda. Just like that homogeneity property, if you plug this in and play around, you'll discover that. This measure cannot be anything else than this. So, if there is a measure that satisfies this in this setting, it must be just this expression. This result, at least this kind of expression, is often uh, referred to by a paper of Christa, 1991, where he studied spectral multipliers for sub in this setting. On the other hand, I think that actually similar considerations and so somehow showing that there exists this kind of plancher and measure with this form is actually much older. I mean, I think there are papers by Lonitsky and Jenkins, for example, in 1984, or even other works where these kind of considerations maybe not exactly the same formalists are dated. So this uh, has been known for a while. Yes. As, as far as I remember, yes, refer to this to this to this equality as yes. yes, but he didn't prove this paper. The who uh, who is Michael 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 Crisp? Well, I think uh, in, in Michael Crisp, there is actually quite a, an argument. I would say, yeah, like what I described that earlier, just uh, this idea of putting characteristic functions to define the the the, the plancher measure. I think actually in this paper there is this argument. Then the Mister wrote saying yeah. that he used the mathematical result. Yes. Did he give the proof of of this? Yeah, you just said yes. I think so. That's my recollection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, as I said, I mean, in my experience, I first learned this on paper by Chris, and I studied this, and I saw so oh, there was actually a good proof from that. But then I discovered that indeed other papers by the Michele Mauchelli and before Ranisky and Jenkins actually had already used this kind of information 
more in the setting of uh, banaster algebra, so get from the transform and so on. But I mean, you can state this in other in a slightly different formalism, but somehow it covers similar design. And so I would say that probably to some people, this 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 this, this kind of result was not even before 1981. So anyway, once we have this. Now, this is nice because at least allows us to characterize exactly when these kernels are actually in two. We have a very explicit expression for in terms of the disclosure and measure, which is very concrete. But on the other hand, as I said, if you are interested in LP boundedness properties of the corresponding operators, you might be interested more in integrability of the kernel. So more L1, not L2 or L infinity. And so what we do with that? And actually, there are a number of results that also go into that direction, we're still using as a fundamental ingredient is in kernel estimates. And let me just say uh, some important ones. One has been also referred to a number of times as Granitsky's theorem. Uh, let me just name it like that. Okay, actually, for Rockland operators, we need even greater generality the fact that if you have that your Multiplier f is a Schwarz class function on the real line, then the corresponding convolution uh, term associated with the sublaplacian is a Schwarz function on the group. Okay, so somehow this invariance of the Schwarz class result, at least in one direction, is in this uh, definitely discussed in this work by Granitsky, uh, even in greater generality, where you have a similar Gaussian type of kernel estimates for the uh, operator. And then this, of course, in particular implies that as soon as you have enough control of derivatives and decay of the function f, you definitely will have some integrability of the corresponding kernel, but this is a bit vague. I mean, how many derivatives do you actually require? And there is a much more precise result, which I will refer to by Chris, and this is the paper that was mentioned before, like one, but actually independently also obtained by Mancheri Meda. These are just the use of publications. Of publication, of course, uh, you know, just slightly different from where actually they, you know, people have found out just the results. And what I'm going to state actually is uh, somehow a result of an evolution of even earlier results when it's this time and the Michele Moncheri and many other people have worked on this problem. So what I'm going to say is that first of all, if you have the F is in some solid space. Which I will denote L2S, where S is the order of differentiability in L2 flavor, or some sufficiently large uh, order S. And we support that also L is compactly supported, just with these ideas, let's say it's supported in one half two, but by homogeneity, one then the change the support as well. Then the Corresponding convolution term is actually integrable, and we have that the uh, L1 norm and even that of the rescate uh, multipliers, because of course, by homogeneity of the L1 norms are the same, independent of T, they are bounded by the sovereign norm I mentioned it, where S is bigger than. The homogeneous dimension. And somehow, as a consequence of this information, if F is no longer assumed to be compactly supported, but satisfies a scaling variant of the condition. Of order S, at least right, bigger than Q over two. We're now key. We are carries in trillion smooth cut off. So here effectively what you are doing is taking a function, you scale it, you truncate it by using this cutoff and a certain particular compact set, and then you measure the Sobolev norm and you take the supreme over all parameters of scale, then this is somehow 
what appears, for example, a similar condition in the Mitten and Mandel theorem of Fourier multipliers, and this uh, is an analog of Mitten and Mandel type theorem for spectral multipliers of the subplash, and that tells us that under these conditions, the operator of the is of width value 1 1 and a p bound for p strictly between 1 and Okay, so we do have. You see a much more precise understanding, at least a finite order of differentiability required under some size conditions or the function of its derivatives in order to guarantee some LP boundedness of the corresponding operator. Okay. And I'd like to tell you something about the proof of these results using indeed this information that comes from the it canals. So as it turns out, the key uh, estimate, which is behind these results, is a weighted L2 estimate for convolution kernel. Where now the weight you see is the power of one plus the homogeneous norm in terms of the sovereign norm of the corresponding multiplier uh, f for being integrated the matter factor to zero and support that again. So let's look at that is common support the fixed constant. Okay, so this is the key estimate from which one effectively can deduce all the other results I'm talking about, because the key idea is that by cauchy schwarz if you want the integrability, you, you can just bound the one norm with the weight of the two norm, where this exponent alpha must be bigger than half the dimension. But here, because uh, somehow the, 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 the homogeneous norm is, is this shape, you need the homogeneous dimension in order to get the integrability of the Probably the inverse power of one plus the homogeneous. And so from this, you get the information. And notice that in the case of R D, where this is just effectively the inverse Fourier transform of F composed with the square Euclidean norm, this is essentially a triviality even without phi plus beta by the, uh, the, the, the effectively the characterization of the subtle norm in terms of the weight of the norm of the Fourier transform. So the point is that here. We cannot just use the Fourier transform in this way, and we need to, to have additional tools or different tools in order to kind of convince ourselves that this is correct. Okay, so how do we deal with that? Well, first of all, the idea is that in order to prove this estimate, we can reduce to the functional calculus. Of not n but e to the minus n, so somehow the propagator at time one, and the convenience of this is that this is a bounded operator. And not only that, but of course we have the if kernel estimate that we can use in this context. And notice that what we mean by that is just that I can just rewrite any function of the sub Laplacian as g of e to the minus Laplacian just by changing values. Okay, and because this is smooth change of variable, we preserve the sovereign regularity of the function. And on the other hand, if I know that the support of A is in one half two, then we, this will tell us that the support of G is in, say, e to the minus two, e to the minus one half, which in turn is containing, for example, minus five half. And the reason why I write minus pi pi is because now one other trick, which I think it's a very old trick, probably going back to Kahan, so some arguments uh, in bank algebras, is the fact that in order to relate some boundedness properties of these operators to smoothness properties of the corresponding functions is to use a truly serious development. So the fact
that we can write our function g lambda. Now in lambda is minus pi pi as just a series with the Fourier coefficient of g and the characters lambda. And now observe simply that since actually because of our choice, the function g vanishes at zero, the sum of the three coefficients will be zero. So we can rearrange this value in this way. So I can re remove the term k equals zero effectively by changing this to like lambda minus one. Okay. Let me again subtract any constant here because of the sum being zero, and then we just so so then the k equals zero vanish. Okay, so I have this, and now this means that our operator of omega, which is just g of m, which will be written as a sum of k integer different from zero of the three coefficients of g times the operator a e to the i k n minus j. And so now the trick is the following. If we have any way of showing that some norm of this operator grows as a power of k with a certain affine exponent, then we can control the corresponding norm of f of l by just controlling the growth of this uh, Fourier coefficient. And so somehow the power decay of the Fourier coefficient can be ensured as long as we have smoothness of g and therefore we have uh, the result of your interest. And now in order to prove this, a key tool are say weighted, in this case, Young's convolution inequality. So the fact that, say, if we define a weighted LP norm of F by putting a power of this one plus homogeneous norm, LP norm, then similarly, I put the time exponential weighted uh, norm like this, P is one infinity and alpha is a negative exponent, then we have, let's say, the convolution, Young's convolution inequality for LP norms actually extends in this way LP norms. And in particular, I can bound the P alpha norm of the convolution by the P alpha norm of one factor and the one alpha norm. The other factor, and similarly, this will be true for the exponential way. Okay, and this is why is it so? Because effectively, by the triangle inequality, we have some additivity of the homogeneous norm, which implies some multiplicativity of the weights that we are using. And so it's just a matter of. Uh, a small trick, I mean, you can distribute the weight from the two factors and then apply the standard Young inequality to get the weight of one. <laughs> so, what can we do? At this point, we have the uh, tool that I wanted to use. So, first observation is that actually, if we take the operator n is e to the minus l, which is the e propagator at time one, this has finite exponentially weighted p norm for any p. And this is just by the Gaussian proof. You can now estimate the case of fast that then exponential way to do the finals. And this is actually the only thing that would be used for the strong discussion estimates effectively. And now, what consequence do we get for the, uh, those guys? Because remember that our key, well, our target is to have a, a good norm estimate for this e to the i, a, n 
minus identity operators. Okay. And so we observe that the corresponding multiplier to the IK lambda minus one, of course, we can expand in power series by using the power series of the exponential. We can make the first term because then it's minus one. And now, very brutally, this means that if you are interested in the, say, 2x norm of this kernel by using the triangle inequality, I will just estimate this by putting the norm inside. This is very somehow uh, removing any possible cancellation that you could have in this uh, sort of imaginary factors here in I to the power n and so on, but let's try to do this first of all. And so we get this a to the n divided by n factorial. And then here I have a power of n. And so if I have the convolution kernel, I will get a convolution kernel of n and then a convolution power. So iterated uh, convolution of n copies of this kernel. Works. Okay. And now I use the weighted Young inequality to split this, this four. So again, factorial, and then I have one factor with norm two, two norm, and then the other n minus one factor with the norm one, with n one. And so one can recognize effectively something which is very similar to an exponential uh, power series, of course, the power series of the exponential function, but now the, 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 the value of the variable is, is, is not here. So effectively, we can deduce that this grows at most exponentially where this constant is this L1 in way the normal is here. Okay, so this we can get. And on the one side, at least this is some control on this norm that is a bit too much because if you really wanted to use this information, you would require exponential decay of this uh, of this Fourier coefficient of g, which is a bit too much. We would just want to find it over the operation bit. But then here comes another nice observation that we can exploit some cancellation by using the L2 structure, directly. that is, if we just want to estimate the L2 norm without any weight of this, well, we just take this operator and effectively multiply and divide by, by n that is composing with n and its inverse. And what one gets. That this is just this expression. And now you can see that we are applying to a function a certain operator. And so we know by the spectral theorem that we have an L2 operator norm bound of such an operator that we can control an infinity norm, the corresponding multiplier. And now we see. That this expression can just be bounded by k. So effectively, if you just work on L2 and use appropriate cancellation properties, you discover that it's much better. It's not exponentially growing, it's just somehow growing as a power one of the exponent k. And now here comes the idea that if without any weight you get this kind of very mild growth. And with an exponential weight, you get an exponential growth. You can expect that with a polynomial weight, you will get a polynomial. And indeed, by a sort of interpolation argument. You can get this result. If you take the operator we are interested in to alpha, you just write it explicitly. And split the integral 
Well, maybe like, so the, 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 the distance from the origin is <laughs> X, so greater than a certain constant that you will choose later, some capital R. And then you see that when this is small, you just bound this by a constant. And what remains is just the L2 norm. So you just get the K and the square, square norms. And on the other side, what we do is to just divide and multiply by the exponential weight, take out the supreme of the, the quotient, and bound the rest of the exponential with, say, estimate here. And then, as soon as you do that and you recognize that the supremum of this function is actually taken when small r is equal to the capital R or approximately there, then you see that you can just optimize between the two and by choosing, say, capital R equal to CK, you get your estimate. Which is one plus alpha because by that choice you can sort of cancel the exponential group there and what remains is effectively the polynomial group by alpha plus one. Okay. So we get this kind of estimate and the, indeed by combining this with the Fourier series decomposition one finally gets the result that almost at least that is now by the Fourier series decomposition, we can use that then the kernel of K of A of A will be bounded by and then we have the growth of these norms that light. And you see that now, if you really want to express it in terms of a subordinate norm of the function g, which would be a weighted to normal the Fourier coefficients, you can just use Cauchy Schwarz and bound this by something like this. And of course, you need to what remains there. And one just notices that this is an L2 sort of norm of G. And this one is finite if big times bigger than say alpha plus three halves. So by this kind of argument and using the fact that the change of variable between F and G was smooth, we are working with compactly supported functions, so this is actually also the sort of norm. Okay, so the proof, the estimate that we wanted <clears throat> when beta bigger than alpha plus perhaps. And now, actually, we wanted this without the three amps. So, how can we get rid of this? And this is somehow interesting, also, difference between, say, the papers by Christa Malcelli and Meta, because Christa actually developed a very much more involved uh, argument to decompose the function, not just this Fourier series decomposition, but much more refined to avoid the three halves in the end. Malcelli and Meta said, just observe that this estimate can just be obtained from this one and an interpolation argument with the Planchard LS. So, That is, recall that for this function, the kernel K of F of L, L2 norm, we do have a much more explicit expression, which is just this. And so, because by the Planchard problem, and since we have this assumption on the support, this is just the L2 norm of F. So effectively, we also know that this holds also for beta equals alpha equals zero by just the Planchard. 
So effectively, what we have shown is that if we take the diagram of validity of the desired estimate, well, we have proved at step five that this is true for beta period alpha plus three halves, but because of the Plancherel formula, we also know the same is true here. And so somehow the Moncherian made an interpolation trick is that well, by interpolation, you also get this. And so Okay, so this is the proof, or at least some ideas of the proof of this way that the two estimate, which, as I mentioned, then by Cauchy Schwarz implies the L1 estimate when now we require smoothness at least Q over two, because that's the reasonable dimensional parameter associated with the homogeneous norm. Okay, so now. Uh, the point is that one can then discuss is uh, whether this threshold is actually sharp, is optimal or not. And in some sense, I mean, uh, one actually might believe that this is the case because it's very natural, this parameter associated with the underlying geometry. I mean, it fits very well with all these cauchy schwarz arguments. So seems to be the right parameter to be used better. On the other hand, it's not completely obvious what to do uh, a priori, even, if, uh, even just to prove that this is optimal. Let me just say well. So the question is, is the threshold Q over two in the, the one estimate chart? So this the one estimate. And well, in step one, yes. But here, so just to say that at least in some cases, this is, uh, this is actually the sharp argument, but I mean, uh, uh, this of course is the case where G is just a D, and this is just a standard Laplacian, and this Q is just a topological dimension. Okay, so all this setup that we've discussed includes as a particular case, the Euclidean. Case. But when the stack is bigger than us in the non commutative case, which is somehow the new part, then this problem is still open. So the sharp threshold, as you can denote by S0, uh, for which <laughs> This kind of estimate holds for any S bigger than if it's not, is known only in few cases, relatively few cases. And actually, all the times it's known in this setting is actually different from uh, the homogeneous image. It's, it's, it's more. And well, somehow. What are the trivial bounds in a sense on this sharp threshold? Well, this is not maybe not so trivial because we took a while to prove it, but this is what Christian Malcherin made a proof that definitely we make at most is half the homogeneous dimension. On the other hand, by some sort of uh, transplantation uh, argument, you wish perturbation argument by freezing the coefficients, one can show that for sure one cannot go below half the dimension of the first level. 
because if you freeze the coefficient of a sub Laplacian, you just get a partial Laplacian in the first layer direction. By comparison with the Euclidean situation, definitely you cannot do better than a partial Laplacian in the first layer direction. So this is a classical result of the Euclidean Laplacian that transplanted here just by freezing the coefficient would do that lower one. But of course, in step one, this quantity is coincide in general, they are bar apart. And what's the right result? As it turns out, uh, in a number of cases where this threshold, this sharp threshold is known, it turns out to be again half the topological dimension, at least in many situations. Uh, somehow surprisingly, because it's, that it's not so clear how this topological dimension is related with the underlying geometric structure in some sense, but of course it's the dimension of the man. And uh, but, but still, that's the case. And the first discovery of this phenomenon I think, is due to Hebisch and Müller and Stein independently, who proved this result in the case of the Heisenberg group. So now, in the remaining time, I'd like to at least introduce the setup and just to give you some idea of how one could prove this improvement of the result. Mm -hmm. So, Here, it's a, a two step and important rule. Let me just introduce coordinates x, y, u. The first layer is a two m dimensional with coordinates x and y. Second layer is just one dimensional. And the group operation is given by. Okay, so here, as it turns out, the homogeneous dimension is just the dimension of the first layer plus twice the dimension of the second layer, the logical dimension is one plus one, and the horizontal rank is just the dimension of the first layer. Okay, so what, uh, how is the, does the sublaplacian look like? So we need to consider the horizontal like the invariant vector fields. It's J, you can just work out what these are, these like invariant vector fields that extend the standard partial derivative in XJ and YJ directions. And by working out this by using the group law, we discover that they have this one to the x over the xj minus yj divided by 2 du. This is a polynomial coefficient operator, as I mentioned yesterday, and the yj will be a yj plus a plus u. And one can recognize that they, of course, do not span a companion space at every point because we are missing one direction, but we take the commutator to get the u and that's somehow showing the bracket generating condition. So the sub Laplacian is L minus sub J plus J and it's square square. And this you can actually work it out a bit more explicitly if you just take the squares of this vector field, we get the square of the test like xj and yj, so we naturally get some full Laplacian in the xy directions. Then you will get some tests in which are the square of u, but we have a coefficient in front of it, so separating the Euclidean norm of xy divided by 4 the u squared. And then you have a mixed term, which is something like uh, xj, then yj, minus yj. Xj. Okay, and this is some sort of rotation, so angular derivative in the xy directions, and then this is now there are a number of important properties that one can deduce from looking at the structure of the Heisenberg group. One important thing here.
is the fact that the structure, in particular the sub Laplacian, is invariant under the action of the unitary group on the first layer. If we identify the first layer as CM with X and Y, the real and imaginary part components, then you can act with the unitary group on the first layer, and you can check that this kind of pieces are all invariant under these kinds of rotations. So as a consequence, it turns out that the kernels in the functional calculus for the sum Laplacian of the Heisenberg group are actually radial in the first layer variable because of the invariance and the unitary. Not only that, but the sub Laplacian commutes with the central derivative, because it's the, uh, the U commutes with all the vector fields, in particular, because we have some squares. Okay? So if you wish, we have a joint functional calculus of the sub Laplacian and the central derivative. And actually, an important tool to study this. Uh, sub Laplacian, uh, at least a possible approach, is taking a partial Fourier transform in the central variables, in the U variable, and you see that if you just look at this formula and you take the partial Fourier transform in U, you will get that all this derivative in U become multiplication by the dual variable. So we actually get a family depending on the dual variable mu of U second order operator on the first layer, which at this form, so the Laplacian Z, then we have this uh, sort of potential term, if you wish, this quadratic potential term, and then we have, again, this kind of angular derivative term, but with the new multiplier. And this is what is often known as the twisted Laplacian. What is written in front of the sun? Sorry? What is written in front of the sun? Uh, I times I mean, okay, yes. yes. Can I ask? Yes. Yeah. Stupid question. No, no. So it's radial in the real terms. Yeah. I mean, it's just because, anyway, the unitary group is transitive on the sphere. So even if I'm not so many. Rotation still, you can rotate any point with any other point with the same norm. And so at the end of the day, it's enough the unitary structure to get radiality. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So we have the switch of Laplacian, and actually, it's quite well known how to study the spectral theory of this uh, operator. So for mu different from zero, we have uh, the twist of Laplacian as discrete spectrum and actually we know what this looks like and each point of the spectrum actually has infinite multiplicity so there is infinite dimensional eigenspace but only one the dimensional uh, the subspace of radius eigenfunctions, and so the corresponding radial eigenfunction are actually given by the gap functions. Probably normalized, where here I'm using the notation L A and T will be equal to minus U for like a polynomial k degree n okay so one can work out more explicitly how this and uh, somehow the spectral decomposition of the twisted Laplacian look like there is also a twisted convolution can be used to discuss uh, spectral theory and functional calculus related to the group convolution of the Heisenberg group and somehow Make a long story short, from this information, one can actually obtain a quite explicit formula for the partial Fourier transform of 
the convolution can have a function of the sub Laplacian, which up to some constants is given by an expansion in this radial uh, eigenfunctions of the of the twisted Laplacian. So you will see the corresponding eigenvalues as you might expect, appropriate normalization. Where here there is some implicit constant which may depend on, on the dimension. Okay, so one thing that I would like to point out is that by using this expression together with orthogonality properties of the Laguerre function, one can actually recover the Plasher formula, at least in very, very special case that we have before. So if one works out what are the inner products of these Laguerre functions. Then I want to check this result is a, again a constant dependent on k here, which I can try. So these functions are orthogonal with an appropriate weight and we need some normalization constant there, if we now use this expression to compute the L2 norm of this, well, First of all, we have a partial Fourier transform, so we apply Plancherel in one variable to reduce to the L2 norm in Z and mu. This is Euclidean Plancherel. So we have an integral in mu. But then in Z, we have the composition in an orthogonal system of functions, so we can actually use the orthogonality of this to actually transform this uh, integral of uh, this sum of the power two to actually a sum of the squares of the coefficients. And so we get something like this. And then we do the appropriate renormalizations, that's what you get. And again, we do some implicit constant and this is what it is. Once one works this out. Well, we can just, now we want to reduce this to an integral of f with respect to a certain variable. And to do that, we can just sort of uh, exchange some with the integral and then make a dilation. So change of variable in the integral and we can effectively reduce to this. And now we bring back the sum in which we will find definitely the coefficient we had before but also some coefficient coming from the change of variable by dilation. And this, if you do the maths, you will get something which has a power of n plus one because n to the one here. So that's what we get. And then that's the result. Now, if we look at this formula carefully, we see how does this behave for fixed n, because n is just a dimensional parameter. As n to the power of n, this is just one plus n to the minus two because it's n minus one. And then, so then, this is n to the power of n minus one, but it is then n plus one here, so you get minus two. So this is summable. And so, indeed, you get the L2 norm of f, and this guy is just the, uh, the homogeneous dimension. So you get exactly the formula we had before for the Plancher and formula on an arbitrary certified group in this very particular case. Now, since I'm at the end of my time for today, I would like just to point out something that we will use uh, to improve the result on the Eisenberg group. And one part of the improvement that comes from the fact that in this sum there is still some air, in the sense that this converges, but converges very well. And we shall see that actually by somehow changing a bit 
the formula we will be able to reduce this exponent still to the limit of some ability and still get some, some gain from the fact that we still have some, some space there to, to still get some money. Okay. This, this, you have written Q over to homogeneous dimension, not Euclidean. That's the, the homogeneous dimension. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because as I said, this is. So you wrote twisted Laplacian or R to N. Yes, 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 yes. So M, 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 M is M the dimension. Two M is the dimension of the first layer. Yes. But then the, we are working on the Heisenberg group actually, where. Uh, individual, individual, yeah. individual. Yes, so two is two M plus two. Yes, yes. so the, the, the first layer is yes. two M, second layer is one, one dimension, so that the homogeneous dimension of the eyes in the group. And so, indeed, this matches with the formula I had before with this argument by Christ uh, that I mentioned before. I mean, with an earlier, you can just by homogeneity consideration and the fact that you know that the heat can is a two deduce that such a formula must be true. And here I just showed that one can also work it out very, very. Pedantic in a sense by using all this uh, in function uh, the composition. But as we shall see, this information that there is still some air here in this uh, some ability with this one plus one, 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 one plus one plus one plus one. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Okay. Are there any other questions? Yes, one question. I'm referring to the first part of your talk, and you were talking about this, uh, this functional calculus. Yes. Multiplier theorem. Yes. With, with the half of the dimension, homogeneous, homogeneous dimension. Yes. So, because you did not refer to the way of question. Yes. In your yes. Everything, I think, goes for not only sub Laplacian, but for the sum of even powers of mm -hmm. properties. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Rock quantum operators, for example. Yes. Is that what we have of the dimension? Confused. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You can prove the result. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I mean, mm -hmm. as you might have seen uh, in this argument using the, you mm -hmm. an estimate. Really, this is what I use. Mm -hmm. And so, actually, what is the order of the? I mean. The, the heat panel estimate now I made and raised it already. The, the, for, the, for, for a second order operator, you might expect something like this as a, as a decay for the heat panel. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah, sorry. If, yeah, yes. if you put uh, higher order operator like Rockland operator, you could get something with slightly different powers and need to adjust for homogeneity and so on. But as a matter of fact, as soon as you have this information, then everything else works out quite finely. So that's why at the end of the day, all this kind of machinery can be run for Rockland operators. And it's even true that uh, on the Heisenberg and related. DA groups, if you work with the Rockland operator, not this argument which uses the function expansions, but a slightly more refined uh, abstract argument to Evisions and Kievich actually applies, and one can actually get the half the topological dimension that I send with the or DA groups even for Rockland operators. Yes. So, what yeah. you, what you, what you, so, if you take on the Heisenberg group, yes. Uh, Different dilation structure. So, yes, different yes. dilation structure yes. on the first uh, one, then two, then. Yes, for example, yes, yes, yes. yes. You consider operator uh, x1 squared minus x2 to the fourth part. Yes, something like that. Yes, exactly. So, uh, you say that uh, uh, multiplier theorem holds with uh, half of the topological. Top of topological dimension. Yeah. Because homogeneous dimension is in this case six. The, the homogeneous dimension is six. Still, by using the similar machinery that I showed here with maybe some adjustments, one can actually improve relatively easily to the uh, actually the degree of polynomial growth of the group, which is still four anyway. But then by using the efficiency in Kievish machinery, one can get that to three. So anyway, we go to the rational part of it. But then, of course, all this kind of stuff is, is disappeared. Now, I, I just chose 
to, 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 to present this, although I know there are slightly more refined arguments because it's a bit more concrete. And especially it's this point here that if you don't have the, this decomposition, I mean, how to see that there is still some air in the summability here, which is one of the crucial points. I mean, you can do it with slightly more abstract arguments that requires uh, somehow uh, more, more, more work to, to get to that point. But one can do it even without looking at all this like every function position. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, if not, thank you very much, Alessio, for today's talk. Uh, we we'll continue with uh, Alessio's talk uh, tomorrow, and we meet. Well, 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 well. Well.